We gather together this morning as people of the risen King. So let's stand and sing together. Come people of the risen King who delight to give him praise. a seat. Well, good morning. Welcome to St. John's if it's your first time or if you're returning after having been away. Um, And of course, welcome to those who call St. John's home and are here each week. There are many passages of scripture that remind us of how important it is for Christians to meet together as we're doing here this morning. So Hebrews 10 says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near then in Colossians 3 we are told what the content of our gathering should be let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart to God and whatever you do whether in word or deed Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So this morning we will be letting Christ's word dwell in us richly, as we've already sung about our delight to bring him praise, and we will sing together again later in our gathering. We'll be reading from Paul's letter to the Colossians, and Daniel will be teaching us from that in his first sermon here at St. John's. After hearing God's word speak to us, we will then speak to God in prayer, And we'll encourage one another to continue doing everything in the name of Jesus, not only on Sundays, but every day of the week. So let's start by thanking God together in prayer. And the words that come up behind me. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for life and health and safety, for freedom to work, leisure to rest, 
and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we continue with the collect. Almighty God, in your wisdom, you have so ordered our earthly life that we must walk by faith and not by sight. Give us such trust in your fatherly care that in the face of all the perplexities, we may give proof of our faith by the courage of our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So a bit of community news. Happy birthday, Lee, for tomorrow. No, Tuesday. Tuesday. Hope you have a great day on Tuesday. Have it. I give thanks for Lee. Father God, we do thank you for our sister Lee and for the way that you are working in her. We pray that you will be with her, especially this week, that she'll have an encouraging uh, time uh, celebrating her birthday. And we pray that you will continue to walk with her, or, uh, that she may continue to walk with you all the days of her life in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy birthday. Uh, don't forget the meeting after church today where we'll be uh, voting on nominators uh, to be helping us uh, select a new rector for church here. So we'll be having that nominators meeting after church today. Tomorrow morning, morning prayer will uh, resume again. We've had a bit of a break because of holidays and public holidays and the like. So 8 a.m. Uh, on the Zoom link that you'll find at the bottom of eNews. If you don't get eNews, come and see me. I will send you the Zoom link. Uh, Wednesday, I will be at Chenzo's for a cafe catch-up, so please come and join me. So 9.30, great opportunity for us to be able to chat about life, the universe and everything. Or something, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, we are going, we try to have a prayer meeting together once a term, uh, and we're considering now that we're at 9am on a Sunday morning, that it might be good to have those prayer meetings um, after church on the Sunday morning. So we're going to have our first one of those on Sunday the 16th. Uh, so that's next Sunday. Uh, so we will have church, we'll have morning tea together and then come back in with your morning tea and we will pray together. Uh, so it's a prayer meeting for church. On the 30th of October, so we actually have a fifth Sunday in this month and that's the fifth Sunday of the month, uh, we're going to have a training, uh, tr training for the sound desk and the data projector we're not so sure about live stream right now, but if you're at all interested in of learning how to do the live stream, please let us know and we will make sure there's some training in that. Uh, but yeah, just an opportunity. We really need people to be able to operate uh, the technical side of things at the back here. Uh, and so we'll have people available to be running some training in that after church on the 30th of October. There's a few external conferences coming up. So we, uh, we mentioned these a few weeks ago. Uh, there's the uh, Christian Women's Convention uh, on that last weekend in October. And then there's a seniors conference in early, no in mid-November, sorry, mid-November. And then in January, summer school's back. We're praying summer school is definitely back this year. Last year, uh, we got washed out. Uh, it didn't go ahead because of, I think, both COVID and rain, actually. Um, so we'll pray that it definitely goes ahead this year. Oh, there's a bit of buzz. No. Um, yes, so I registered for that last night. Going to be up there camping. It's a great week. Uh, well, it's not quite a week, but a great period of time of meeting with others, uh, hearing uh, good Bible teaching and um, being encouraged to think about taking the gospel out to the world. So if you're interested in that, there are usually are people who organise some day trips as well. So if you're going up just for the day and would like to be, take others with you, then please let me know and we can help coordinate that. So that's January. Uh, I don't have a slide for this, but home groups, uh, the books that we're going to be working through, the discipleship books, they're due tomorrow. <laughs> so I tried to get them here for Friday. They're due tomorrow. So if someone from the group is able to pick them up from the office or I can arrange to drop them to, see, to people, um, I think it's mostly just the two Wednesday night groups who will need those. Um, and if you're not in a home group and would like to be, come and have a chat with me. We can arrange that as well. I missed anything? I think we've got it all. Okay, well, we're going to hear the scriptures read in just a moment. Lynn's going to be reading Colossians 1, but let's, um, let me pray for us as we prepare for those scripture readings. 
Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach and encourage us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Lynn. Right. If you'd like to turn to, if you're reading it in Colossians, please turn to uh, page 983, and I'm reading from Colossians 1, but it will be on the screen as well. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. For this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed the whole world it, it is bearing fruit and growing, as it is also as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for endurance and patience with joy. Give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that, create, that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. 
For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This is the word of the Lord. Well, in response to hearing God's word read to us, let's stand and say together what it is that we believe. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hand over to Daniel. Hopefully my microphone's working, yes. Good morning, everyone. Please excuse my voice if it fails me a little bit. I was at a wedding last night and was a bit too energetic, but we'll see how we go. James Earl Jones is, was a voice actor. He's just recently retired. Uh, he's most well known as the voice of Darth Vader, um, although another popular role of his was the voice of Mufasa from The Lion King, which you may or may not have seen. If you haven't seen it, it's an animated movie from my childhood about the, uh, the animal kingdom and particularly the lions who were in charge, being you know the kings of the animals. Um, so, I am going to start by quoting Mufasa. My voice is absolutely nothing like uh, James L. Jones. If you want to hear his voice, go watch some Star Wars. Um, but in the movie, Mufasa is with his son Simba, and they're on their throne and looking out over their dominion. Uh, and this is what Mufasa says to Simba. He says, look, Simba, everything the light touches is our kingdom. A king's time as ruler rises and falls like the sun. One day the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new king. Now, Mufasa and Simba uh, were kings over an animated animal kingdom, ruling over talking, singing, dancing animals, uh, and their throne was a big rock. So we won't take the illustration too far. Um, however, what Mufasa, what Mufasa says as he's trying to instill a sense of responsibility in his son uh, is certainly true about earthly rulers. He says, a king's time as ruler rises and falls like the sun. Through the Old Testament and through all of history, we see that that's true. We see the rise and fall of many leaders, pharaohs, judges, and kings and queens uh, through retirement or politics, death or war, or many other things. Just recently, of course, we've seen our own monarchy uh, change as Queen Elizabeth passed away and Prince Charles was... Uh, coronated. In contrast to all earthly rulers, however, Jesus is no ordinary king. Uh, so to contrast Mufasa's quote about kings, uh, this is a quote that I've taken from Revelation, uh, and yes, quoting many loud voices in heaven, which say in Revelation chapter 11, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul is going to great lengths to remind the church in Colossae of the full, incredible supremacy of King Jesus over the world and over us, his church. Before we get into it, let's pray. Heavenly Father, may your Holy Spirit guide my speech and calm my nerves. And as we hear your word today, may you bring us to a deeper understanding of the fullness and glory of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord that we may better love you and serve you as Christ's church. Amen. So we start at the beginning. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. 
This is a letter that Paul has written, real people in a real place at a real time. And so it's a typical greeting at the beginning of the letter, which helps us, we get to see who's involved. Paul, he's with Timothy, and they're writing to the church in Colossae. We also know that Paul is writing this letter while he's imprisoned, most likely in Rome. The strange thing with this is that unlike most churches, most of the letters that Paul writes in the New Testament, Paul has never been to the church at Colossae, and he was not involved with sharing the gospel there. He did not plant the church. Um, So we see that in the next verses. He He says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. Paul heard of their faith. He didn't see it. He wasn't the one who... <clears throat> excuse me, shared the gospel with them. And then if we jump down to verse 7, we read that the Colossian church learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. So Epaphras took the gospel to Colossae. Uh, after his own conversion, he heard the gospel from Paul and then returned to Colossae and took the gospel there. Uh, and now Epaphras has come to visit Paul in his imprisonment to report on the churches in Colossae and nearby. This is confirmed when Paul writes another letter during his imprisonment to Philemon, and he says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. Which tells us that Epaphras not only came to report to Paul, but Epaphras ended up imprisoned with Paul. I'm not spending any more time on the first section of Paul's letter today. We're going to return to it uh, later in the term, and there's way too much content for me to try and cover in my first sermon. Um, But it is helpful to have read through it, so thank you, Lynn, for reading through it for us as we wrap our heads around the context of the letter. Um, So Paul is writing to the Colossians in response to the report he has received from Epaphras. He doesn't know these Christians personally, nor has he ever met them or ministered to them, yet he feels compelled to write to them, to encourage them in their faith, and and to encourage them to be thankful to God for the gospel that they've heard. And now we arrive at verse 15. Ooh, did I skip a slide? Oh, yeah, that was Paul giving thanks to God and encouraging the Colossians to give thanks as well. So that's all in the first 14 verses, which we will come back to later. Now we arrive at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I titled the sermon, Jesus and Us. Actually, it's kind of a a series title as well, actually. We'll see if that changes once I learn more about the rest of Colossians. But I want to stress that especially today, this is very much Jesus and us. Uh, Interestingly, though, even though this is all about Jesus, through that section that I just read, Paul never uses Christ or Jesus or Lord, but simply refers to he and him. However, there is no doubt that he can only be referring to one person, Jesus. Paul wants the Colossians, and so to us, to understand beyond any doubt the full picture of Jesus, because for Paul, Jesus is supreme over all creation. I don't know what you think of when you hear the word supreme. I think of pizza. Uh, We don't use the word supreme much else beyond pizza nowadays. Uh, So... Have you ever eaten a Supreme Pizza? I have not, because I'm too picky. Uh, The problem for me with Supreme Pizzas is that they have everything on them, and that's too many vegetables. In that picture alone, I can see at least three things I don't like to eat. (laughs) So, Supreme Pizza, it's called that because it's the ultimate pizza. It's got everything. In life, Jesus is supreme. He has the supremacy. He is over all things. So... We need to understand why Jesus is supreme. Jesus has supremacy over all things because he is the creator. If we look at verse 15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. This can immediately cause some confusion. Go 
at that point, yes. This can immediately cause some confusion because um, this verse has been used out of context to claim that Jesus isn't God, isn't one with God, that Jesus is the firstborn of creation. Um, but to justify that means you have to take that verse completely out of the context of everything else around it. Uh, because if we look immediately at the next verse, in verse 16, we see that it says, for by him all things were created. So he cannot be part of the creation if by him all things were created. And then we go, <coughs> we go on to read that through him and for him all things were created. Or if we consider John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then later on in verse 14 it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see the Word, which, crea which was in and or and or of and for all creation, and all creation was for him. And then we can read in verse 14 that he is the son of the Father, Jesus. So what did Paul mean by using the word firstborn of all creation? In Paul's time, firstborn doesn't just refer to the oldest child, but to the honor and status and inheritance received by being the firstborn. So usually a firstborn son, but not always. And when Paul uses the word firstborn here, it is, it is a word picture of the fact that Jesus has the right to, the ownership of, all creation. It's his. All things were created through him and for him. In verse 16, Paul makes the point of saying, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. This is a particular um, thing that he's addressing for the church in Colossae, and we come back to that, and it's a theme that we come back to later in the book, but you get the idea. We talked at the start about kings and queens and rulers on the earth, rising and falling like the sun. All thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, all things, they were created through and for Jesus. If we look back to the image of Mufasa and Simba looking over their dominion, it's a beautiful picture of creation. Uh, of course, once again, this is an animated picture, so not quite the real thing, but they looked out over that land and they saw the responsibility and the power that they had because they were in charge of it. Yet they did not create it and they were only in charge of a very limited area of the world. For another picture, shortly after Trinity and I got married, we went on a hot air balloon flight. It was amazing and terrifying. I've never been more afraid of dropping my phone while taking photos because <laughs> you will never see it again. But the view that we saw below us was incredible seeing God's creation all around us. Uh, and we were looking down on the creation, and it's an incredible feeling standing high above it all, seeing it down there. And when I looked, I felt a sense of awe at God's creation. When Mufasa looked, he felt a sense of leadership. Yet this pales in comparison to Jesus. When Jesus looks at the world, it isn't something that he feels responsible for as a leader that's been put in charge. He's not God's caretaker of creation. If anything, that's us. Jesus is the creator and has supremacy over it all, and it all belongs to him. Jesus is supreme because he is the creator, and more than that, he's also the redeemer. If we read now from verse 18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus died and was then the firstborn from the dead. This time Paul's use of the firstborn does apply fully. Jesus is the firstborn into new life. He's the one who defeated death and opened the way for us to return to the Father. We could not achieve that on our own. Uh, and... Oh, yeah. We could not achieve that on our own, but God was pleased to come to earth as a man to purchase us by his blood. Have you ever heard the saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps? Uh, it's not as common now, so my generation don't know it as well. But um, I researched it a little bit because I've, I've only heard it in passing. Um, and it turns out that the origins of the phrase are from an 1800s physics school book. So there you go. Uh, that's what high school physics was interested in 200 years ago. Uh, it is funny how that phrase has developed over the years, 
Uh, now it's more used by people to talk about you know, self-achievement, you know, carrying yourself over the line, get, getting yourself ahead. You've pulled yourself by your own bootstraps. But if you think about it, it's actually an impossible statement. You actually physically cannot lift yourself off the ground by pulling on your shoelaces. And that's, uh, that's probably why it was in a physics textbook. They were looking at the physics of not being able to lift yourself up. Maybe that can be a conversation starter for you after the sermon, after the service. Uh, see if you can lift yourself up by your shoelaces. Uh, and yet, though this is impossible for us, this is actually what God has done through Christ on the cross. This is the amazing grace that God has extended to us, that we couldn't in any way reconcile ourselves to God. He is a holy God and perfect and beyond anything we can do to reach Him, yet He reconciles us to Himself. He is the sacrifice of Himself, for Himself, and he lives the perfect life that none of us could possibly live. And he makes peace by the blood on his cross. We're not involved at all. All that we bring is the sin that we need to be saved from. So, as I just said, spoiler alert, where are we in all of this? I said the sermon was Jesus and us. And this is, this is the us part of it. Um, we're in the same place as the Colossian church in verse 21. And Paul says to them, and you... And it's kind of an, it feels like it's accusatory, and you, you know what you did. Uh, it's probably not actually his tone, but that's how it feels to me. He says, you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Have I got the right slide? Yes, I do. Excellent. All right. Doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Where were we? Alienated. Cut off from God. Not only that, but we were also hostile towards our Creator, doing evil deeds. But the Gospel cuts right to the heart of the issue, and Christ, in His death and resurrection, redeems us to present us holy and blameless, above reproach. We cannot be accused of evil deeds and hostility anymore, for in, in us, God only sees Christ's perfection. Jesus has supremacy over all things. He is the Creator, and He's our Redeemer. Lastly, Jesus doesn't simply leave us to fend for ourselves for the remainder of our lives. His sacrifice was once for all, the price paid, yet now as we continue to live and work on earth, Jesus remains supreme as the sustainer of all things. If we jump back to verse 17, it says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. So God didn't set the universe in motion and then sit back to just spectate. Uh, we established earlier that all things were created through Jesus, but not only that, we now see that all things hold together in Him as well. To be cut off from God is to be cut off from the source of life. The price for sin is death, separation from God, yet Christ's redeeming work allows us to come back to the giver of life, eternally sustained in Him. So Christ is sustaining us as He brings us back to the Father, who sustains us with life. We have no life apart from God. Christ also sustains our fellowship together, as it says. Oh, I've gone too far. Oh, no, I haven't. That's right. Uh, as the head of the body, the church. Supposedly, a chicken can survive without its head for a while. That was an urban legend that I grew up on. That's what everyone used to love to joke about at school. A chicken can run around for three days once its head's chopped off. Uh, and so I googled it. I was curious. Uh, and it's not really true. It's... it's it's sort of like how a lizard's tail can keep twitching after it falls off, uh, that sort of thing. I'm not going to get into the gory details. Uh, so just like everything, a chicken and every person's body uh, and the church needs its head to live. If Jesus is not the center of our church life, at the forefront of our gathering together, then our fellowship is not built on the sustaining life that it needs. And if we turn to verse 23... It says, if, in, yep, if, indeed, I've just lost it. if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So at the very beginning of that, the first bit, the if is the important part. We have to actually continue in the faith. The gospel that we cling to is the truth we must be sustained by. Jesus will sustain us and can sustain us if we continue in the faith. 
to live by the gospel is the fullest way for us to live. That's God's good plan, is for us to live in the light of Christ. So Paul urges the Colossians to continue in the faith, stable and steadfast. Do not shift from the hope that you have, Jesus, who is supreme over all things, and in him we can be sustained to the very end. So what does this mean for us? Well, it lays out pretty simply in the end. We have Jesus, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer, and we are the receivers, created, redeemed, sustained. We we have also seen we are also alienated and hostile towards God. We need Jesus. It can actually be easy to think, I'm not evil. I don't, you know, go around doing all the evil things that we call evil people do. And I'm not hostile towards God. I'm not angry. I'm not, you know, actively trying to undermine him and run away from him. But to say that sort of thing is to actually dangerously downplay God's holiness. God is absolutely perfect and absolutely just. And we have chosen to go our own way rather than God's way. And that cuts us off from him, the source of life. So we do need Jesus. So let's continue applying it to ourselves. He is the creator. And as his created being, we need to return to the creator. Jesus' message during his ministry on earth was repent and believe the gospel. We must turn back to our creator. Jesus is also our redeemer. In his death and resurrection, he freely offers us the redemption that we so desperately need. We must accept that gracious gift to be reconciled to God. And Jesus is our sustainer. Having returned to him and accepted his redemption, continue in the faith. Remember too that Jesus is the head of the church, So here at St. John's, we must keep Jesus at the heart of our church life. His mission is our mission, his gospel is our gospel, and his truth and rule comes first ahead of all else in our church. And he will sustain our Christian walk. In our personal lives as Christians, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and guides us and spurs us on to faithfully follow Christ. And if we hold to the faith, he will sustain us in our Christian walk. So what does it look like to continue in the faith? Have a look through the passage we've been reading. I've only looked at nine verses today. Uh, And in all but two of them, Jesus shows to us the all-encompassing presence and supremacy of Christ, that he is in everything and over everything. In verse 15, the firstborn of all creation. In verse 16, for by him all things were created. In verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Verse 18, that everything, in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Verse 20, to reconcile to himself all things. And verse 23, proclaimed in all creation under heaven. I shouldn't have looked away, I lost my spot. I know. So, the challenge to us is, If Jesus is all of this, if Jesus is everything, like we've seen in the passage today, do we treat him like that in our whole life? How often do we find ourselves only praising Jesus for his greatness on a Sunday? Only dwelling on his word once a week at home group? Only praying to him when we're with other Christians? Paul is teaching us that Jesus is our sustainer, and we must continue in the faith We must be drawing near to him as he draws near to us. We need to read our Bibles regularly. We need to seek the Lord where he can be found. Psalm 19 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It goes on, read Psalm 19, it's one of my favorites. The whole middle section of the psalm is all the incredible goodness that comes from reading God's word. It finishes in, in verse 11, this, the middle section of the psalm. Verse 11 finishes uh, in verse 10, sorry. More desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. We need to be reading our Bibles regularly. We need to pray about everything that we are fully, <clears throat> excuse me, that we are fully relying on Jesus, who is sovereign and sustaining all things. Life is full of struggle and difficulty, but Jesus is Lord over all things, so trust all things to his love and care. 
Philippians chapter 4 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. A massively well-known passage. Yet how good are we at forgetting to walk with the Lord in prayer? Both when we're distracted by how difficult our situation is, or on the flip side, how easy it is to forget the Lord when life is good. Yet if Jesus is in everything, if he is the supreme creator, every good and perfect gift is from above. When life is hard, pray. So too, when life is good, pray. We should rightfully be thanking and praising the Lord when he generously gives us so much grace that we don't deserve. Lastly, as we look at continuing in the faith, we need each other. Christ is the head of the church, and we are the body. As it says in Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25, it says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So Jesus is the supreme Lord of all. He created all things. He sustains all things. And more than that, he's redeemed us. We're challenged by passages such as these to realize that we do fall short of keeping Jesus on the throne, that he has every right to. And we must renew our desire to continue in the faith, to serve and glorify God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the best news is that when we fall short of this task, Jesus has already reconciled us to God by his death and resurrection, presenting us holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your graciousness to us, for sending your Son to die in our place, that we might be reconciled to you. Lord, please give us the strength to serve you better. Give us a heart and mind that wants to serve you before all else. Through your Holy Spirit, please guide us as we live for you on earth, and please help us to always see Jesus See him as he truly is and serve him as we should. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Dan, for that very clear sermon. We are going to stand and sing now about the redemption part of that creator, redeemer, sustainer uh, in Man of Sorrows. Please stand and sing. Oh! 
All my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, who is free and free, oh, my rock and cross, my salvation. take a seat. Well, now my debt is paid. It is paid in full. So knowing that great, great news, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let me remind you of these words that we just read in Colossians. For in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. By grace you have been saved. Let's say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Our Father in heaven, sorry, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Murray Louise is going to continue in prayer for us. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you that we can enter your holy presence with joy and thanksgiving because Jesus shed his blood for us. We thank you that instead of being hostile, 
and your enemies, we can be at peace with you by trusting Jesus Christ for salvation. And as your holy people, we can come to you confidently, knowing that you will hear our prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, we worship you as the creator and sustainer of all things and pray for the nations of this world in their chaos and suffering. We look forward to the day when every knee will bow before you and suffering will end. We pray for parents mourning their little children in Thailand, for those grieving in Ukraine and Russia. May there be someone who can point them to Jesus in their grief. We also pray for Christians in Sri Lanka, suffering hardship due to the economic situation, and Christians suffering persecution in India, the Middle East and Africa. Strengthen them, we pray, to remain steadfast in their faith and trust in you in the midst of their suffering. We thank you for Christian aid agencies supplying practical support and encouragement and for those who give financially to make this possible. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, we intercede for your servant, Charles, our King, as he begins his reign that he may acknowledge you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and never be ashamed of the gospel. Lord, we also pray for the Diocese of Southern Queensland as a new Archbishop is elected, that the administrators of the diocese will seek your will in finding a godly man who loves and obeys you and your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for our church here at St John's that we'll, we will be led by your Holy Spirit as we appoint nominators to find a new rector. We pray for wisdom and insight for the nominating team as they search for the man of your choice. Lord, we thank you for our parish leadership team, Chris, Michelle, Daniel, and the parish council, praying your blessing on their ministry and your wisdom in their decisions. Almighty God, we also pray for ourselves as the body of Christ, that we would be submitted and obedient to Jesus as our head united in love and fellowship, always seeking to glorify and obey you, whatever the cost to ourselves. We bring to you in love and compassion our brothers and sisters who are facing any type of adversity or distress, that you would comfort and strengthen them in their trouble and suffering. We especially pray for Elizabeth and Emma, for your comfort in the loss of Liz and Betty and your guidance in the, in the adjustments Elizabeth and Emma need to make. Lord, we thank you that Cassie Hayes is recovering, but continue to pray for her healing and for her rehabilitation to be effective. We pray for Shirley's daughter, Debbie, as she has surgery on the 24th of October. Thank you that the medical staff has been helpful and supportive and we pray that the medical treatment will be blessed by your healing power and that Debbie, Shirley, Thelma and the whole extended family will experience your peace. Our Father, we pray for Reese and Marge as Reese organises a, a BCA nomads gathering during the week starting the 15th of October. We ask that the gathering will be a time of warm fellowship and refreshment. Hear us, Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Amen.
concluding prayers. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us with your word and encouraging us in our meeting together. We pray together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to stand and sing together our final song at the name of Jesus. Finish up. Let me encourage you with these words from Colossians as well. Continue to, let me encourage you to continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been, create, has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which we at St John's have been reminded today. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Feel free to grab yourselves a cup of tea, coffee, glass of water or something and then we'll come back in here uh, for the meeting about the parish nominations.